This is Reaganism, a podcast dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today. I'm Roger Zak. I'm your host, director of the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. On this episode of Reaganism, Roger speaks with Dr. David McCormick, former CEO of Bridgewater Associates, former Republican candidate for U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania, former Undersecretary for the Treasury for International Affairs and the George W. Bush administration, and proud graduate of the United States Military Academy about his new book entitled Superpower and Peril, A Battle Plan to Renew America. They also chatted about what lessons we can learn from President Reagan's leadership and legacy and the best solutions for American renewal. Dave McCormick, welcome to the show. Hey, Roger. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Well, I understand you have the great city of Philadelphia behind you. Philadelphia in the background. Yeah, I'm here for a couple of days. And, uh, you know, I grew up in the western part of Pennsylvania in Pittsburgh. Uh, I, I've lived in Pittsburgh for a number of years, but I haven't spent that much time in Philadelphia except every year for the Army Navy game. So uh, I'm here for a couple of days, and this is a beautiful part of Philadelphia in the background here. Well, yeah, as long as you don't have to watch uh, a Phillies or, you know, Flyers game, uh, I, I imagine you're comfortable. Well, listen, in- I'm all for them as long as they're not playing against Pittsburgh. There we go. <laughs> Uh, but we'll get to your book, which we'll introduce in just a moment, but I know you are a regular at that Army-Navy game, and I hope we'll get back to it. But first, just for our viewers and listeners, you're the former CEO of Bridgewater Associates, a former candidate for U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania in 2022, uh, worked in the Bush administration, Bush 43 administration as Undersecretary of Treasury, and of course, you, uh, a West Point grad who served in the first Gulf War, but you're here today because... Uh, you are the author, along with James Cunningham, of Superpower in Peril, A Battle Plan to Renew America. Congratulations on this book coming out Thank you. Uh, middle of March. Great read with all the experiences and things you've been up to, particularly that Senate race, which no doubt we'll discuss. Why did you write a book and where did you find the time? <laughs> well, I started, to, you know, I started to write the book a couple of years ago, but, but it was based on a fundamental belief, which was sadly... 80% of Americans agree with, which is we're going in the wrong direction. And the title, Superpower in Decline, uh, is really what I believe. I think uh, uh, the great America we know and we've experienced in our life is in uh, in relative decline and absolute decline. Uh, but we've been there before. You know, in our history, we get to the edge of the cliff and we pull ourselves back. And so this is a book about how to renew America by educating our people, by confronting China, by uh, by uh, by building up and securing uh, America, and uh, and it was an opportunity to really lay out a path based on all those experiences. Yeah, and, and no doubt it came up in the Senate race, and and you and I have had opportunity to to work together at the Reagan Institute. I know you've been thinking about this deeply for some time. You know the the, the title, the superpower in peril. You know, in red, it, it was like it gives you this kind of pessimistic feel, and then we're we're kind of saved by the battle plan to renew America, and it's interesting that you reference. Uh, kind of the American people's view here, that they that in many ways their sense of the direction we're going in is, is something that you agree with and you outline in, in the book. Uh, a lot of the indicators suggest that we are in decline, but ultimately this is a story of how you think the fundamentals are there, provided we have the right set of ingredients, um, we can kind of get things going. First, let's start with the decline side. You mentioned 80% of Americans think we're going in the wrong direction. What are the kind of key pieces that demonstrate to you from a data standpoint, put on your old McKinsey cap, you know, your, your, your Wall Street analyst cap that really suggests that there are things we have to be concerned about? Well, there's a number of things. Uh, first of all, we have uh, record high inflation, highest in 40 years, uh, which, is, uh, which is near double digits. We have uh, our national debt of $31 trillion, un- unsustainable. We have our military in relative decline, uh, and certainly its growth and capability is is uh, plateauing, to, to say the least, and arguably uh, degrading. We have um, we have immobility. In other words, if you think um, America is about opportunity, increasingly most Americans think their kids are going to be less well off than they are. Uh, we have uh, wokeism, which is which I talk about. There's a chapter in the book about the wages of decay, which is essentially our institutions. Whether we're talking about the military or our schools or our Congress or our media, really being overtaken by a woke ideo- uh, ideology that's really um, uh, counter to 
the basic concepts of merit and liberty and individual freedom and accountability that are key to America. So I see all these things. And, and Roger, if you'll give me a minute, and it'll be, I'll, I'm going to take a little time here. But the reason that I'm optimistic is we've been here before. Right. And I lived through it. And it's relevant to, to what you do today. I remember in the 70s, sim, late 70s, some of the same conditions. We had record high inflation. We had malaise. We had um, Desert One, where a lot like Afghanistan, where we lost service members due to incompetence and bad bad decision making. And uh, that was when I was like 14 or 15. I, I uh, The local mill in my hometown laid off people to McGee Carpet Mill. Some of my friends' dads were uh, on the unemployment line. I, I trimmed Christmas trees in the summer. And some of the dads would show up to, to earn a couple extra bucks. And yet four years later, when I was a plebe at West Point, walking across those incredible walkways, looking up at those mountains, it was morning in America, right? The economy was on fire, deregulation, a uh, buildup of our defense. But most important, most important, the national spirit, we believed we were on a path to renewing America and recognizing we were the greatest country in the world for short years. And that's why this book starts with the ominous superpower and peril, but is a truly a book of optimism and hope because uh, I've lived through it. Yeah. And, and we, I want to talk about morning America and, and there's great treatment of Ronald Reagan uh, in your book. Again, we're speaking with Dave McCormick, who author of superpower and peril a battle plan to renew America again on Amazon. But before we go to those Reagan years, um, you know, you, you referenced Twain and history is rhyming. You mean in the, in the 1970s, you've seen it before in Carter and you really, uh, you could break it down to policy areas, you know, inflation is a commonality. There are some differences between 70 today. The energy crisis is not certainly not the same, uh, although it's a challenge today, but in the end it's this crisis in American confidence. And, um, you know, something I was thinking about reading this book in preparation for this conversation is that our, uh, Peggy Nunes trustee, of the foundation recently wrote uh, uh, in her weekly column, Wall Street Journal, re re looking back at the Carter Malay's speech. I don't know if you saw this, Dave. I saw the piece. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it made me think of, cause you, you, you hit on it as well in the book. You say something to the effect of, frankly, before Peggy wrote it is that, um, you know, Carter was right in diagnosing the problem. Right. But, and there's the big, but that she emphasized recently in the journal that you em emphasize in the book, there was this leadership aspect that was lacking. You're a West Point grad. Leadership's very important to you. You've led companies, both you know, the largest hedge fund in the world to uh, a company that you, you know, started and ultimately went public. Where does leadership fit in all this? Well, you know, it, it was a, the, writing the book was a process of discovery because you, you realize that you could present all the great policy uh, ideas in the world, but if you don't have leadership that can find the path to making those happen, then, then they don't mean anything. So ideas without leadership to inspire, leadership to execute, leadership to unify is, uh, are just ideas. They're uh, in the dustbin of history, as uh, is, is was once said, right? So um, leadership's everything. Um, and, and what we lack now um, uh, in the current administration, in my opinion, and, and across America is leadership that's gonna uh, unify, uh, in our case, conservatives and Republicans around an agenda. And, uh, and that's what I'm trying to do in this book. I'm trying to lay, put forward an agenda for how to renew America. And, um, you know, uh, decline is not preordained, right. but neither is renewal. It depends on what we do. And the Reagan example is so powerful because it's a great example of it's, the challenges were somewhat different, but the leadership moment was the same. And, uh, and that was what uh, led to a great period of decades of, uh, of outstanding performance and growth for America. So let, let's stick on the Reagan theme here for a second. And Morning of America, of course, that, um, you know, was Reagan's theme in his, in his reelect, winning, you know, 49 out of 50 states. You have a quote from an unlikely character, really actually getting to this uh, point that you're making, that it's you have to have the right policy, but you need the right leadership. Uh, the quote I'm referencing, which you pulled up, and amazing research for this book, uh, eluded me until reading it, from Senator Ted Kennedy, who observed that Reagan, quote, stood for a set of ideas, that's what we're talking about, the policies, and he wrote most of them into public law, certainly a, a key accomplishment for any administration, right? You get you have an idea, policy initiative, you get the Congress endorsement, but uh, Kenny goes on to say, but into the national consciousness too, right? 
getting it into something that the the country believes in. When we talk about the economy, you know, which is which was the the restoring our economic prosperity that was key coming out of the Carter years, key for today. Why is it so important from a business perspective, Dave, that people believe that the national consciousness buys into this morning America? Well, you know, I think, um, and it, it goes to a little bit to our current diagnosis too, to take the actions that are necessary to ensure America remains exceptional, America's worth saving. You have to believe at, at its core, at its foundation, that, it, that America is exceptional. You have to believe that our capitalist system our free market system as a way of allocating capital and bringing about um, prosperity for all Americans is the best way to do that. You have to believe that America is a force for good in the world. And the thing that was, uh, and I, I, I'm almost embarrassed to do this with someone who knows Reagan as well as you do and some of the probably your viewers, but what struck me about reading about Reagan and living through that period was both the simplicity and the clarity of the vision of America's role in the world, of the uniqueness of America, of the American dream, of the promise that America offers to all people, not just in America, but around the world is a beacon of hope. Uh, and it was because of that unerring faith and clarity of purpose that he was able to articulate that. And then there was a set of plans, very important, and execution that followed up on that and good people that he hired. But it was that clarity of vision, um, you know, the, the most simple one, which, uh, you know, about the the Cold War, which is one of his many famous quotes, is uh, 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 they lose, we win. Um, but but in the most simple terms, he could articulate that for all Americans. And they felt it and they connected to it. And it gave them a sense of confidence. And, um, you know, I'll stop on this in just a minute. But the thing that of many little data points that are most upsetting to me and most worrying is when you talked to the, 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 the next generation, the, my kids and your kids, there, it's not obvious to them. It's not it's not uh, etched into their brain that America is the most exceptional nation in the history of the world and that it's done more good for humanity than any other society in history. That's not obvious to them. And if you don't start with that understanding, despite uh, America's many challenges and faults, if you don't start with that understanding, then it leaves you a little bit lost on what you're pursuing. So uh, I yeah, think that was the key. I think right. a lot of people are struggling with the last point. Uh, maybe there are objective kind of data out there to, to suggest that, you know, the future doesn't look as promising. Uh, although I tend to think of it as, you know, the concern amongst the servers about wokeism, it's an educational piece, right? And may, perhaps it's a function of our peace and prosperity. People don't quite realize, understand um, how much opportunity is before us, how far um, we've come actually, and, and, and the exceptionalism of our country and our history and our founding principles and documents really is, is, is what allows us to achieve that. Um, you know, one of the things in your book that I thought you did a great job of was almost how you've witnessed the ups and downs uh, through your own life in Pennsylvania and you know, growing up uh, outside of Pittsburgh. You referenced before, you know, the 70s and, and the challenges, economic challenges and the doubt uh, that, that, that you saw and witnessed. But then you also talk about the transformation of Pittsburgh itself. Take a minute to talk about that and how that informs your view on the renewal side of the house, right? So part of the book is talking about how we're in peril, the decline, but then you have this confidence and optimism that we can do this. And that's like because of the the town you're from almost and what you saw. We, yeah. We saw. Yeah, no, thank, thanks for pointing that out. So uh, I, I actually grew up in Bloomsburg, which is up around Scranton, but I was born in Pittsburgh. Okay. And when I left the army, I came back to Pittsburgh and I spent more than a decade in Pittsburgh. And that decade was right smack dab in the middle of uh, the Pittsburgh Renaissance. And uh, I, as I describe in the book, I, I use it as a sort of a metaphor for what was happening in Pittsburgh, but I had uh, young children and I was a big runner at the time. That was before arth arthritis hit my uh, my middle-aged knees. But I would take the stroll and I would run through, through downtown Pittsburgh, not downtown, but the upper part of Pittsburgh, the Oakland area, where you have Carnegie Mellon and you have uh, University of Pittsburgh and you could go and look down on the Monongahela and you'd see where the where the steel, uh, where the mills had once been and the cable cars would take the, the workers down every day and the soot was so thick you couldn't even see in front of you. And in one run, you could you could see both the old Pittsburgh or the remnants of the old and the, and the new. And the new was this incredible combination of talent because you had two of the greatest universities in the world, uh, Carnegie Mellon with... Um, 
robotics and artificial intelligence, and you had uh, University of Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center with medical science, and you had, uh, so that's great combination of talent, you had investment that was coming in from the federal government and basic R&D, you had investment through companies that were coming, the Ubers of the world and Amazons and uh, Googles were setting up centers there because the talent was there. And uh, and you saw just this incredibly multiplicative compounding effect. And my company was one of those uh, 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 Carnegie Mellon sort of based companies where we hired a bunch of developers and we built a software company in Pittsburgh. And during my 10 years there, you saw this transformation from old to new. And uh, Pittsburgh still has its challenges, but it's a dynamic place. It's very technology intensive. And, uh, and we built a company that hired uh, about 600 folks right there in, in downtown Pittsburgh. And so seeing that little microcosm and experiencing that, it's different in some ways, but it's also very similar to Morning in America. Clarity of purpose, a plan, taking advantage of the great talent and grit of this workforce in and around Pennsylvania, and then bringing together the ingredients for innovation, which is talent, capital, data, and so forth. Yeah, and, and that's what I wanted to hit on because you, you talk about this talent, technology, and data being the ingredients for our renewal, that uh, the technology and unleashing the innovation, you know, is clearly part of your professional experience, you you know, uh, investing in it, growing it. Um, and, and what you talk about today, you use this term of loss of productive dynamism. Um, so, you know, Pittsburgh, figured it out and, and much of what the you know, gig economy, you know, is enjoying is a, is kind of, you know, that's one of the hubs where, where, where it emerged. Um, you know, of course, Silicon Valley being the, the, the first example, why are we in this place where we don't, where the problem is loss of productive dynamism? Talk about that a little bit. Well, if you, if you look at productivity today, productivity is, is at, at a relative low um, compared to the last 50 or so years. And, Productivity is a key driver of economic growth, vitality, um, social mobility, all the things that are, are, are bulwarks of the American dream. And so um, if you think about um, being at an inflection point and thinking about the things we can do to ensure our strength of our economy, our strength of our military capacity, our strength and our ability to assert uh, American influence around the world, uh, and pro productivity improvements, a, a big piece of it. And what's happened, and I described this in the book, there's, there's been something that's happened over the last uh, decade or so, where you have this confluence of technology, national security, and economic dynamism. And there, were, there was always the case where economic vitality and national security were linked, but never in the history uh, of the world, in my, in my opinion, have they been so interdependent. And so if you think about um, our national security capability, as an example, you can't think about that without understanding in the top you know, 20 relevant technologies in the world where we are relative to our adversaries. If you think about our economic growth, the technologies that are going to be critical to creating new jobs and realizing the American dream are the same technologies that are going to be critical to um, our national security. And so that confluence requires us to think about the drivers of productivity and what we need to do as a nation to ensure that we're getting the most out of our talent, uh, that we're focusing um, our investments in areas that are gonna have the most impact for our economy and for our uh, national security, and doing that in a way that's consistent with our basic principles of free markets and capital right. allocation and the dynamism that comes with our economy. So we need to have a model that doesn't replicate China but that is the American unique, uh, a uniquely American model for innovation. And that's what I try to lay out the book. Yeah. And, and, and the, we got to China in the conversation, you know, we, we held off for about, you know, 20 <laughs> plus minutes or so, but, but we talk about this dynamism and the challenges we're facing, you know, China of course is the adversary uh, that we're competing with at every level. All those things that you said are, are necessary to uh, kind of return, uh, renew America to where it, it's rightful place. You know, that, China is the challenge that that we're, we're competing against. Just before we get there, when you were in Pittsburgh building the company, going public, leveraging the the innovation and the software, it didn't translate. The, the, you you describe in the book that the, the benefits and drawbacks of the American economy that yeah. we're innovating, we're um, in many respects coming up with the technology and the know how, but offshoring 
manufacturing capacity. We'll get down in a second in terms of the Reagan Institute work we've, we've done together. Talk about perhaps how the policy uh, was a little too optimistic and perhaps didn't internalize that the dynamism you're emphasizing in the book um, didn't fully appreciate that the the unfettered free market, or at least letting China exploit it, would undermine uh, that objective. Well, there's th- that that dynamism operated at a couple of different levels in the book. I, I described free markets where I was the CEO. We took it public. It was uh, by any measure a, a, a success, but we ultimately didn't innovate quickly enough. And I wasn't the, just a, a small correction. I wasn't the founder. There was two guys that founded it, and I joined and eventually became the Elevated CEO. Elevated CEO, yeah, yeah. They were they were the uh, they were the, uh, the the true entrepreneurs in this case. But uh, but this company was wildly successful in Pittsburgh, wildly successful IPO. But the pace of change was such that software, which was initially on a CD that you'd uh, uh, you deploy in your company, went to the went to uh, software as a service almost overnight, and our we didn't make that migration quickly enough. And so I ultimately sold uh, the company uh, in, uh, in, a, in a, a good transaction for shareholders and so forth. But, but the next generation of companies really, the, the reason I tell that story was during that same period, my, one of my investors was Kleiner Perkins, which at the time was the Silicon Valley firm. And I would go to a CEO conference every day, a CEO conference every year was, uh, of all their Kleiner companies. And I remember sitting across the table and I was a hundred and fifty million dollar company that time, and you know we felt really good about our success. And there was this other company there, this guy Sergey and Larry, who were talking about this company Google. And I was like, God, I don't know about that thing. I don't know that thing. <laughs> and 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 you know, of course, uh, I, as I know in the book that uh, they went on to they went on to great things, and so did Pittsburgh, and uh, and we sold free markets. So so this dynamism um, is is hard, right. and it's disruptive, and you got to constantly be in the forefront of change. And the disruption that happens to our economy is also happens to our workers and family. And um, and that's, on balance, a very good part of our economic system because that's what creates the constant renewal of industry, of companies, and so forth. But it's highly disruptive. And um, what we missed, uh, in my opinion, as Republicans, was that um, those free market policies had a lot of second and third order, uh, order of terrible consequences that we weren't aware of and didn't act on. And there were two I want to highlight, um, and one relates to China. First is the enormous disruption that happened in communities and hollowed out communities without an understanding of what that meant for the American dream, what that meant for their capacity to get the skills they needed to go on to uh, productive careers and have the uh, the American dream opportunities that we want for all Americans that dis- uh, disproportionately hit certain minority groups. So it was really bad for uh, our society at large, even though in some sort of economic calcul- calculation, it was good. So getting that balance right and being very aware of that disruption and d- addressing it from a policy perspective was critical. The second thing that happened, Roger, and I can't believe it, I actually can't believe it, and we we dealt with this on the Reagan task force, we outsourced to China, became dependent on China for a number of critical, critical industries, semiconductors, pharmaceuticals. It is inconceivable to me that we're highly dependent on uh microchips for most of what we do in a modern society. And the most sophisticated ones are largely 90 plus percent manufactured 90 miles from mainland China. That was an oversight and a failure of multiple generations of policymakers that is almost unforgivable. The, 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 I was going to follow up on the China piece, and then I want to talk about the disruptions in American communities, because it, you, know, you have some thoughts at the outside of the book in particular, um, in terms of what you saw, your, your Senate race and you're thinking about, uh, Republican politics, but we'll get there in a moment. Let's stick with China. From the standpoint of you, we're kind of an early watcher, um, policy maker, raising these concerns on China. And you outlined this in the book uh, before you know it was cool, right? <laughs> before everybody yeah. was was pointing to this, and this was during the the Bush administration. Take a minute to talk about what you were seeing then, and and some of the policies that you know you were thinking about trying to advance, but ultimately. It wasn't fully embraced until President Trump was elected. Yeah, no, I think President Trump did did a lot to bring focus on it. Now, it, it all started uh, even a little bit before the government, where where I I took a trip. I left the army and I traveled for an, uh, almost eight eight or nine months, and I went to China uh, by myself with a backpack. This was in 1992, and uh, there was this great book by Paul Thoreau called "Riding the Iron Rooster," and it was about riding these dilapidated trains through China. And I said, I got to track that. 
And China at the time was rural. I mean, I would go for a run in, in downtown Shanghai and the elder Chinese would be out doing Tai, tai Chi in the morning and they would look at me like I was some sort of foreign, uh, which I was obviously, <laughs> and we, we were, it, I was a complete outlier. I would go a, a days at a time without seeing a Caucasian traveler. Fast forward to 2005 and I'm the undersecretary of commerce for uh, export administration, which is the, it was really the governor for commercial technologies that get exported around the world. And there was tension with China. Because China wanted advanced technologies, whether it was, uh, you know, uh, composites that would go on on, uh, on on aircraft that could have military use, or avionics, or um, or, or semiconductor or software uh, kinds of technologies. And I was, uh, we were essentially were the ones who defined the criteria. And I, uh, I as the undersecretary, put in place a, a specific set of rules that would limit certain things to China. And uh, believing, and I wrote at the time in the in the Financial Times and gave some speeches, say that we had to be extra careful that we didn't give China technologies, particularly in light of the thievery of our intellectual property and some of the behaviors that could be used to support the military. And the Chinese were very upset by this. In fact, President Hu raised it with uh, President Bush, and so there was a National Security Council uh, meeting where I attended, and you know, <laughs> President Bush had no idea who I was, by the way. Uh, but this. Uh, this was uh, who's the karma guy interfering with my yeah, son. Who's, who's, yeah, who's <laughs> who's creating problems down there? But um, it was an it was an early indicator. Um, and then at the Treasury, I saw more of this, which is the path China was on, the expectations we had for everything for how technology would be used to market access for U.S. companies. The deal wasn't um, wasn't on track. And what's happened over time is that those the, the behaviors of China and the interests of China have diverged more and more. And, and where I think the biggest failure is, is not recognizing that sooner. I think it's a bipartisan failure. I think uh, there's lots of blame to go around. And I think this is where you got to give President Trump a lot of credit because President Trump came in, he hit that right on the nail, right on the head. He called it the way he saw it. He was right. And that began to shape uh, U.S.-China policy um, much more favorably in the right direction. And I think now there's a, a an opportunity to really create a coherent strategy. And the book tries to lay out a coherent strategy for confronting China, which is holistic and really uh, uh, redefines our supply chains, brings home um, strategic decoupling in terms of the things that we need to do at home or close to home. You and I hit that in the task force. It, uh, it puts constraints on business with China. It doesn't let investors invest in things in China that are going to support the PLA and uh, the Communist Party. Um, it holds China accountable for its thievery. It holds China accountable for things like Wuhan COVID, which um, becomes more obvious by the day, what was obvious already, which is that was emanating from the, the labs in Wuhan. And it, it holds China accountable for its bad behavior from a human rights. So a much more holistic, coherent uh, a set of accountabilities on China, which I think also will limit China's ability to challenge America around the world from, world from a technology perspective. And I'll, I'll leave a final point on that. There's one thing to read on this, Roger, and you've probably read it, is Bob Lighthizer's 2017 report on technology with China, where he laid out the 20 technologies, and China was already then um, in the lead on about half of those. And it's because of a lack of uh, coherent response on the part of America. I hope I hope we're getting better on that. Yeah, you mentioned Bob Lighthizer, of course, the U.S. Trade Representative during the Trump administration, and I, I had no issues with what he did vis-a-vis -vis China. It was... It was exacting tariffs on friends and allies that perhaps was a little more curious set of decisions, but we can deal with that in terms yeah. of why uh, why we had to be concerned about I don't know uh, Canada and steel and, and tariffs on them. But let, let's let's go back to your prescription in terms of China policy, and and I was pleased, not surprised uh, that it covered was comprehensive, uh, all aspects, including human rights, being part of the business community, a fair bit of your career. You've had public service, of course, but uh, much time in, in the private sector. How hard is this going to be, Dave, to, to truly get the CEOs, leaders of these companies, many are multinational, the obligation is to the shareholder, to think twice. Now, the tip of the spear stuff, the stuff that is most relevant to national security, you mentioned semiconductors, you know, the the kind of reality, the political reality has, has, has basically revealed that the days are numbered there. But even something like we're dealing with right now, your former office in the Department of Commerce is trying to prevent uh, 
U.S. semiconductor companies to sell into China, uh, which they rely upon from revenue, which ultimately helps the U.S. economy. How do we think through that? You know, leadership, no doubt, is a part of it, but also is it something ultimately the business community is going to be able to yield to? But what's your take? I think you have to, if if nothing else, I hope we've learned um, over the last two decades that this is not largely, they're, they're related, of course, but this is not largely an economic question. It's largely a national security question. So in other words, I think the answer to your question has to be looked at through the prism of national security. So what does it take to ensure that America remains secure? What does it take to ensure that America's interests abroad uh, are protected? If you believe, which I do, that China poses an existential threat in the following sense, that the ideology of the Communist Party is one of expansion, that it's a zero-sum orientation, that China is set on displacing America as the global superpower, and that is promoting an ideology around the world which is counter to U.S. interests. If you believe that, as I do, and you then you think about this as a national security question, and, and then it doesn't become a black and white issue, but you say, what industries, what technologies contribute to uh, the rise of China in the way that I've just described? What relationships with our allies uh, should we leverage in a way that supports U.S. interests? So, for example, I view this as a little bit of a set of concentric circles. So if you think about America's economy at the center of it, we have a set of uh, allies on the, on the first ring, like the five I countries that we trust with the most, uh, you know, the most uh, secretive and significant uh, intel uh, with all sorts of unique U.S. Uh, capabilities. There's a second concentric circle, which are important allies, but aren't a part of that group uh, where we have aligned interests and so forth and so on. And I think we should be leveraging uh, those relationships in terms of who we do economic activity with, but also in certain instances of, of who will uh, uh, combine forces with to not do business with China. And I think that's in America's interest to do it that way. That, that, that seems sound to me, and it's and you know, as you'd expect from a, a, a business mind, it's strategic. You're prioritizing, um, but there's still so much trade, the interdependence, economic interdependence. The trade has only gone up. Yeah, uh, we've seen between the U.S. And, and China in the past year. It seems to be a lingering challenge to the extent we've seen what you referenced before, strategic decoupling. That is, we're, we're going to prioritize the areas uh, most relevant to national security in terms where we're not trading with China, uh, it seems to be dictated as much by uh, President Xi as much as his U.S. policy, and, and that the, that they're so concerned, that is the Chinese are so concerned about maintaining control and stability within their own borders, and they see U.S., particularly media companies, technology, as being potentially subversive, and they kick, yeah. us, kick us out more than we're kicking them out. It's just right. an interesting dynamic. Yeah, no, listen, it's uh, if we if we agree, first of all, if we agree that those exports, those investments that um, contribute to China's the Communist Party's capabilities to challenge the United States to build military, if we agree on that, then that's a huge step from where we were as a country two years ago. Yeah. Right? That's a huge step. Now you're asking the second question, which is, is that everything? Or are there lines again? So I think that we should have a fulsome debate. I, I, I note that within the Republican Party, there's a fulsome debate on that. My thought on that is that we need to err on the side of preventing trade and exports around things that are in the gray zone. But there's lots of things that, uh, and I, I, have, I have lots of stories from the campaign trail. So I would be in, in a single day, you know, I would be talking to uh, manufacturers who said, listen, we've screwed up uh, with uh, outsourcing things to, to China, letting business go to China. We need to bring that manufacturing back here. It's strategic, it's important. And I would say, you're absolutely right. I agree with you. And then I would go to the next uh, place and I'd find uh, a machine shop that uh, is building the frames um, that go on the back of Harley Davidson's motorcycles that are being exported to China. And uh, that machine shop has $80 million of revenue and $60 million of it is associated with China. So, um, and, and I don't see any national security risk associated with the racks on the back of the Harley Davidson uh, motorcycles. So there, there are things that I think are clearly going to be in the non-strategic category that aren't, uh, uh, aren't going to be of great significance, and I wouldn't put restrictions on those. There's going to be um, a, a lot that are in the national security category, and then there's a gray area where I think history has shown that we need to lean into the uh, national security concerns because uh, there's an inertia that pushes the other way. 
Great examples. China policy from the campaign trail in, in Pennsylvania. You mentioned manufacturing. I want to jump there for a second. Of course, you were kind enough to co-chair with uh, former CEO, Chairman of Lockheed Martin, Marilyn Houston, a task force on manufacturing competitiveness here at the Reagan Institute. Uh, this was prior to your run uh, for the Senate. One of the policy issues that came up and the Republican Party is somewhat divided on is the level of industrial policy required to level out the playing field and allow the U.S. to become more competitive, particularly in manufacturing, uh, in these areas where China, of course, uh, the Chinese Communist Party heavily subsidizes industries and weakens our manufacturing competitiveness. CHIPS Act, this is the Semiconductors uh, Related Act, $50 billion from the U.S. government going to address this problem, support fabs, you know, manufacturing in the United States of semiconductors. Give us your take on industrial policy. You know, you mentioned you've had this evolution of source recognizing that the pure free market, at least as it relates to, to China, uh, needs to be enhanced. Where does industrial policy play in in all this? Well, I think the um, you, know, you sort of start, as I have, as a free market, free markets advocate. I ran a company called Free Markets, for God's sakes, right? So I've got, <laughs> uh, I've got good free markets cred. But, but this, uh, this issue of technology, particularly these unique technologies that are, to, that are at the center of national security and, and economic well-being, they're, they're also zero-sum. The 5G example is a really telling example, which is uh, the consequences of the 5G network being used throughout the developing world, uh, emerging markets, uh, if, if that had in fact had happened the way that the Chinese had hoped it would happen, would have had huge national security consequences uh, for us. And so um, I, I, I sort of make the joke in the book, what would Milton Friedman say? And I'm sure he would be unhappy with any sort of government role. Uh, and yet I said, listen, I, I, I'm unsatisfied with the idea that China's civilian military fusion model has gone from 10 of 20 technologies to 15 or 18. I don't think that's acceptable uh, from the national security research. So I'm I'm in favor of the government playing a role um, that I would have probably not been in favor of before. What's happened with the Ch CHIPS Act is in many ways my worst fear. I just mm -hmm. uh, read a great article today in the journal by Greg Ip. If you haven't read it, you should see it. But it's essentially saying all the additional constraints that the Biden administration is placing on the semiconductor manufacturers if they're going to get child care. You know. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I mean, it's like unions. That way, that was an amazing like, one. It's almost like a cartoon. It's like if you could imagine the worst, right? So it's exactly what we had feared. And I think, um, you know, what, what I'm advocating in the book uh, in this chapter is, is two things, which I think are emblematic of success and, and not inconsistent with good, sound conservative policy. The first is, our basic R&D. The private sector has not and will not support basic R&D. Our R&D in the CHIPS Act has gone up a bit, but it's still only half of what it was in 1950 when we had this uh, era of incredible innovation. That basic R&D is a role of government, uh, in, in my opinion, and that basic R&D lays the groundwork for much of the innovation that's required. The second thing is we have to introduce market forces into this conversation in a way they're not. So the idea is not to give money to specific uh, companies and say, go do good uh, for uh, America's interests. At least that's not uh, the ideal state. I think the ideal state is create a set of policies with tax incentives, tax forgiveness, or specific investment that lays the groundwork for investment in certain categories of capability, certain areas. So uh, the example I, I give in the book is perhaps uh, an innovation fund where the government plays a role in investing in a fund along with private investors, and maybe the government takes first loss on the fund, or maybe the government caps its return to ensure greater private capital flowing into an area where there's high risk, like artificial intelligence. And that becomes the basis for private sector investment in companies that they believe make sense, but doing so in a way that the government creates the right incentives. The government should be structuring incentives. The government should not be making investments. And that's where I think the, the basic industrial policy that uh, the Democrats historically have proposed is flawed. And that's why I think the, uh, the military civilian fusion uh, that the Chinese have purported uh, to use is flawed. And I think we need a uniquely American way of promoting these uh, technologies that are so critical to uh, our future. We're with Dave McCormick, author of Superpower and Peril, a battlefield, a battle plan to renew America. Uh, let's shift from 
China policy and industrial policy and go to uh, the other side of it, which is the state of our politics and the Republican Party, of course, running for Senate uh, in 2022. You saw firsthand in Pennsylvania what the Republican Party in particular looks like, how it's changed. Uh, Is it still the party of Reagan, Dave McCormick? I think a lot of it is. But uh, but I think it's uh, listen. Pennsylvania is, in my opinion, at least. I, I don't know the rest of the country as well, but it's a microcosm of, of the country. You have these two big metropolitan areas. You have uh, for Republicans relatively moderate suburbs, particularly uh, in the southeast part of the state. You have this part of Pennsylvania that's very very conservative, where I grew up, uh, Bloomsburg, right around Scranton. Um, you have a, a huge blue collar. Um, Catholic part of the population that's uh, that's traditionally been Reagan Democrats, uh, and so it's a uh, it's a very uh, representative state, in, in my opinion. And what I discovered along the way uh, in these fire halls and diners, you know, I got in this pickup. Truck, I put thirty thousand miles on a pickup truck in about four months, and uh, you know, I just did three, four, five meetings a day, and people are so angry, Roger. You cannot believe how how angry they are. And uh, they're angry that uh, that in 20 years, real income has been flat. They're angry that, um, you know, over the last two decades, if you had uh, assets, any kind of asset, they all went up. If you didn't have assets, uh, you it didn't go anywhere. They're mad that inflation is what it is today, which is killing working families, killing fixed in- people on fixed income elders. They're mad that, the, that they go to the gas pump and they can't fill up their uh, their pickup truck. They're angry that for two decades they've been sending their kids to war. They're pissed off about fentanyl killing 5,000 kids in in, uh, Pennsylvania last year. That's why they don't believe in the future. And so you gotta you gotta reconcile yourself with that. Wait a second. Those are people that we as Republicans and conservatives should be representing. We should be making the American dream available to them. They have a right to be angry, and that's what Donald Trump uh, so ably tapped into in 2016. And so what I'm trying to do in the book. Um, is lay out those concerns, those problems, those challenges, um, and talk about those within the context of traditional conservatism, traditional republicanism, and lay out an agenda that I think 80% of Republicans uh, and conservatives can and should agree with. And listen, here's the thing about democracy. You can have the best ideas in the world, but if you don't win elections, it doesn't matter. And we got to win elections, well, right? That's, ex- that's so exactly that- where I was going to go, because you're talking about this anger. It's 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 you know, whether it's Republicans or Reagan Democrats, all people that could easily, and I know in your mind, should have voted Republican. But of course, it was Senator Fetterman now uh, right. in office, not a Republican. Take us through that. Well, listen, it's, you know, it's not, uh, I'm not going to be a pro- political prognosticator. I would just say the following. I would say that two things are true. That, uh, two things I learned most on the campaign trail. People can agree or disagree or whatever, but man, they want authentic. They want authentic, and they don't get enough of authentic these days. And so I learned as a candidate and as a, like, I want to put, put forward my most authentic self. First of all, it's so much easier. <laughs> it's so much, you know, it's exhausting to try to be anything other than who you are. So you got to be authentic. You got to put forward your authentic self. Um, I believe that, um, and I think Fetterman did, did, was perceived by the voters to be authentic. And I think that that got him a lot of uh, support. It didn't get him here trying to be somebody else. I think that much you yeah. can say about Fetterman. <laughs> That's right. I think the second thing, and, uh, you know, there's a debate about this in the Republican Party. I don't think um, people want to fa- talk about grievances. I don't think they want to look backwards. I think they want to look forward. And I think they want to know that their leaders are going to come forward with plans to deal with inflation and fentanyl and all the problems that I described in the beginning of this podcast. And um, and I think so I think they want acknowledgement of all those issues, but I think they want optimistic, forward looking leadership. And this is what I kept saying in the room. And this is sadly what uh, I wasn't quite able to convince enough people of is that if we put us all in the room together, all the Republicans in Pennsylvania, we agree on 80 percent. We really do. The disagreements are 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 not the majority. Eighty percent of the agenda we agree on, and we agree with um, the the progressive wing of the Democratic Party twenty percent, right? So um, so we need to find a way. And if we don't win elections, we're going to get the twenty percent. Right. And so we, I, I, you know, I said at a speech last night, I don't think we hate losing enough, because if we hated losing enough, 
we wouldn't keep doing stupid things. So I think we've got to find great candidates that can be authentic. I think we've got to find a path to the 80%. And I think we got to win elections and deliver on the promise. And um, yeah, that's what I was trying to do. And that's what I think we need to do as a party. Yeah, we definitely don't uh, hate losing. I, I think that's a, a great point and a good distinction between being authentic, understanding the voters' anger, which you're sharing with us, you saw on the campaign trail, but they may actually prefer someone who's authentic and, and can you know provide a suite of solutions that they can agree upon and is optimistic. Those two things can both be true. We're going to go to our lightning round in just one minute. Very excited to go there, given how much your book uh, – pulled from Reagan and certainly focused on, on, on the ideas and principles that animated uh, President Reagan and, and are relevant today. But before we go there, you start out your book uh, talking about your run for the Senate. I wasn't expecting that when I, when I opened it. Um, and your engagement with President Trump. How much of the uh, experience dealing with President Trump, you ultimately endorsed your opponent in the primary, uh, do you think that will continue to be relevant as we march forward to 2024? It was obviously, as you write, maybe not determinative. I don't think it was the word, but it was highly impactful. You talk about, you know, he was yeah. in Pennsylvania a few hours before you were at a rally, you know, same place. Take us through kind of your lessons there and thought about what it means to the party going forward. Yeah, well, I think when you, when you lose uh, 1.4 million votes cast and I lost by 900 votes. So when you lose by 900 votes, there's, I mean, you, you know, there's a, there's a hundred things a day here, a day there, a commercial, like there's a hundred things you might've done uh, that, that could have won the election. So certainly President Trump endorsing the other guy and, and attacking me, that, that did help, but it was, there was a lot of contributing factors. And for me, you know, I, I, I mean this, Roger, we've talked about this off, off, I mean, it was, it was a privilege. I, I mean, I loved it. I don't have a single regret. It was you know, a, a great opportunity to reconnect with friends and across Pennsylvania. It was a privilege, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to represent the people of Pennsylvania, but I, but I, I don't have a single regret about it. In terms of, of Donald Trump, well, listen, I think he's going to be a huge influence on the future, uh, in part because of the policies we talked about. I mean, I think um, I think he appropriately, and I try to give him credit in the book, um, reset the conversation and. I, I say, I think the words are something like the Republican Party was sleepwalking. Yeah. And what happened in 2016 was a wake up call. And I think it's going to influence uh, our policies and our agenda as conservatives and Republicans for years to come. I think that's a good thing. I think that's a very good thing. We're talking um, with David McCormick, finishing up our conversation about his book, Superpower in Peril, a battle plan to renew America. Get on Amazon or any other place where you get books. We're going to move to our lightning round where we ask all our guests to share their favorite Reagan book, favorite Reagan quote, and favorite Reagan speech. Dave will take all or just one or two, whatever you have to share. Well, I've, I've only gotten through part of it, but I think Will Imboden's uh, The Peacemaker is an incredible book. I know you've profiled it, I, I think. Fabulous, and as as you uh, know, for for your re for your listeners who I hope will buy the book, uh, President Reagan is scattered throughout. I I know uh, his inaugural speech; it's almost like text of exactly the point I'm trying to make in the book about decline and America's uh, America's greatness and its ability to renew itself. And then there's a gr a great quote uh, that I think I have in chapter two, which is something like it's time to realize that America is too great a nation. Uh, to limit itself to small ideas. Mm. And uh, and so I think we're a nation of big ideas. Um, I think we need to be a party of big ideas that win elections and then implement those big ideas. And I think uh, President Reagan was a good, and his administration was a good role model of how transformative that can be for America and for all Americans. Dave McCormick, congratulations on the book. Wonderful to have you on the show. We look forward to having you back. Great. Good to see you, Roger. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Reaganism. New episodes premiere weekly every Monday on YouTube and all podcast streaming platforms. If you like this episode, be sure to let us know and share with a friend.